Thank you here for being here today with us. Um, we are here to talk about um, three different online photography competitions that were developed in connection with the same exhibition. The exhibition was called Snapshot Painters and Photography Bonheur to Year, and it was organizing a collaboration of three museums, the Van Gogh Museum, uh, the Phillips Collection, and the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And that the exhibition was shown at each of the location at different time um, between um, September, October 2011 and September 2012. Okay. Now, before we go into the details of the competition, we want to give you a little bit of an overview of what the exhibition was about, so that you can understand the context in which this competition were developed. Um, the exhibition explores mainly the relationship between paintings and print on one side, and then photography on the other side. Um, at the uh, turn of the 20th century. This is a time where the Kodak developed the first handled camera. You can actually see it here. It's not quite as handled as we might expect today. But at the time, it was a really big change because um, photography was really a complex matter before it was really done by professional. It was a process that took a long time, the setup, the taking the photo, the developing. So it wasn't something that just people could do as they wanted. With this handled camera, obviously, the market was open for general, for everybody to use, that could afford it, to use this camera. And, and artists responded very well to this idea and started to experiment it with, the, with this camera. And, and this was true in particular for a group of artists that were um, in, of the post-impressionist period that were active in France, in Belgium, and in the Netherlands. Now, as you can see sort of um, in the background here, we can show some images that were um, uh, in the exhibitions. And really, you can see that the exhibition explored the relationship between the photos that these artists took and they experimented with, and some of the paintings that they or prints that these artists are famous for. Sometimes the connection is really that are, is really strong. You can really see that the photo is a source of inspiration for the painting. While in other circumstances, it was a little bit more subtle. It's either the inspiration was based on the light and the way that the light and the shadow was cast by the camera, or maybe a specific cropping that was caught by the camera. In any way, this was a unique opportunity for visitors to these uh, three museums to see these photos that were never shown before, and definitely not at the time that the artists were alive. So these were photos that were tucked away in family archives for over a hundred years. So people had the chance not only to see these amazing photos, but to see them in relationship with the paintings and print that these artists made so that they could really get a better insight into the creative process that these artists were putting in place. So now that you understand a little bit what the exhibition was about, let's kind of delve a little bit more into the um, competitions, the photography competition that were organized by the three institutions. Uh, the Phillips also actually organized a um, home movie contest, and um, Cecilia will tell everything about it um, in a few minutes. The interesting thing is that we had the same exact exhibition, more or less. I mean, it was adapted slightly to the location, but more of the concept and the, and the works of art were the same. But each um, location, also, each museum also used a different approach to the online uh, competition. So I think that in the first part of our uh, date, of our panel today, we will um, each of us describe what the their own competition was um, their objective the implementation challenges that were that we had to face how people responded to it and the lessons that we learned then we have prepared a bunch of questions for each other that will allow us to explore a little bit for further uh, what we learned from this experience and then we will open up to questions uh, for the public is it okay now the first presenter um, could not be physically here with Good us job. today. <laughs> there she is, virtually. Her name is Edith from the Van Gogh Museum. And since we didn't know how well the sort of um, the um, sort of connection was going to be, we pre-recorded her presentation, <laughs> and then she'll be joining us live in the sort of discussion and questions part. Okay, so let's hope that everything works fine. And. Without further ado. Hi, everybody. I'm very grateful to the MCN organization for letting me participate in this session all the way from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Oops. Sorry. I don't know what happened here. Let's try one more time. Hi, everybody. I'm very grateful to the MCN organization for letting me participate in this session all the way from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Sorry I can't be there to join you. 
Let me introduce myself first. I am Edith Schreurs and I'm working at the communications department of the Van Gogh Museum. I'm consultant online media and therefore responsible for the Van Gogh Museum website and social networks. Together with other colleagues from communication and marketing, I was involved in organization in organizing the photo contest, Take a Snapshot, which ran exactly a year ago on the occasion of the exhibition Snapshot Painting and Photography. The Snapshot exhibition was on show at the Van Gogh Museum from 14th of October 2011 until 8th of January 2012. Let me briefly explain what this exhibition was about. In 1888, the invention of the first easy-to-use camera for amateurs made spontaneous photography possible. The snapshot was born. The enthusiastic users of the earliest amateur cameras included many artists like George Hendrik Breitner, Pierre Bonnard, Félix Fayetton and Édouard Villard. The exhibition shed a light on the question what role did photography play in their lives and how did it influence their work. The exhibition was a collaboration with the Philips Collection and the Indianapolis Museum of Art. The exhibition was presented around three themes. Private life, public life, and posing. The Snapshot photo competition ran from 10th of October until 31 December 2011. The contest also revolved around the three themes of the exhibition. Since one of the sponsors was the City of Amsterdam Tourist Board, known for the I Amsterdam sign, as you see here, we decided to confine the subject of the competition to Amsterdam in relation to the themes of the exhibition. This was also a way to limit the subject of the photos and to show that taking snapshots was still relevant today. The themes formulated were family and friends in Amsterdam, city life in Amsterdam, and posing in Amsterdam. The jury consisted of two persons who both selected a winner every month. We approached professional photographer Patricia Stur to select best snapshots for each theme. Head of exhibitions, Edwin Becker, selected best theme photo, and there was also a public award, the photo with the most Facebook likes. We asked Canon to provide the first prize, a Canon photo camera, the Amsterdam Tourist Board for the second prize, a three-day Amsterdam Visitor's Pass, and photography magazine GUP for their third prize, which was an annual subscription to their magazine. We used Facebook as the entry point to the competition. This was before the timeline was introduced, so we published a tab in the left side menu, and Facebook users who weren't yet a fan of the Van Gogh Museum first saw this splash page when entering our Facebook page. This page connected you to the contest site, so you didn't need to be on Facebook to enter the competition, but you did need a Facebook profile to vote. For promotion, we used our own channels like Facebook, Twitter, website, newsletter, and we also connected with our partners Canon and I Amsterdam to promote the contest. We also created a small video teaser, which I'm going to play now. exhibition hallway, the contest website was projected. Visitors of the exhibition could also swipe through all submitted photos and see the winners on the iPads. This projection and the iPads proved to be a challenge for our ICT department. The targets we set were fan growth on Facebook of 2,000 extra fans each month and 500 photos submitted each month. That would be a total of 6,000 new Facebook fans and 1,500 photos submitted. So, what were the results? Well, in total we welcomed almost 4,500 new fans and in total 1,891 photos were submitted. So we didn't reach our targets. But was it successful in any other way? The second month, November, 
proved to be the most successful month. Over a thousand photos were submitted. The total amount of visits of the content we contest website in three months' time was 29,000. In comparison, the total amount of visits of our exhibition page on our website was 20,000. There was a lot of positive feedback on the contest and submitted photos, and much engagement and interaction on Facebook and Twitter. We were surprised by all the various subjects you could see on the photos. Loads of bicycles and cyclists, people in the streets or in the park, snow-covered streets of Amsterdam, and events like Queen's Day or current affairs like the Occupy movement. It gave us a sneak peek of what visitors of Amsterdam from the Netherlands and abroad liked about the city and how they perceived it. On the other hand, we doubt if the participants connected this photo competition to the exhibition we were running at the same time. And there were other issues. It took a lot of time for the jurors to select a first and second prize winner. Because of the way the contest website was designed, it was not possible to view all photos in one overview. It was also not that easy to publish the photos on the iPads in the exhibition each month. The ICT colleague who set it all up left the organization right after the opening of the exhibition and other ICT colleagues were not informed well enough. Another point of critique came from the visitors of the contest website. They would have liked to tag the photos so that they could order the photos themselves on a deeper subject level, like bicycles, people in the park, events, bridges, and so forth. When we started the competition, we decided we would not beforehand control what photos were submitted, but we would monitor what photos were published on the contest site. In the beginning, we were very strict. If it did not suit the subject, we would delete the photo. If there were more than five photos submitted by one person, we would remove the extra photos. But this seemed to be a lot of work. So later on, we decided that we would not delete a photo if it did not match the subject, but that that photo could not win. Here's an example of such photos which definitely were not taken in Amsterdam. <laughs> Working together with partners I Amsterdam and Canon helped us a lot in awarding the prize winners, but also in promoting the contest. We find that three months is too long for running a contest. Maximum is about four to six weeks to hold the attention. Keep it simple. The audience needs to know in a first glance what the contest is about and how to join. Test, test, and test again. We have learned that it is very important to take plenty of time for testing, both the contest website, but also the way the screen in the exhibition hallway was shown, as well as the publishing of the photos on the iPads. This, need, this needed a lot of bug fixing in the first weeks when we were live. And last but not least, keep it simple to yourself as well. Make sure you don't need to do too much manual labor during the competition and afterwards. We just finished a new competition. It was a voting contest called Vote for your favorite Vincent. Facebook users could vote for their favorite Van Gogh artwork from our current exhibition, Vincent the Van Gogh Museum in the Hermitage, Amsterdam, and tell us why it was their favorite. We took the learnings from the snapshot contest, but find that there were some other improvements possible next time. We still don't have the best recipe for running a contest, but we keep on trying. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you Edith, and uh, we will um, talk to her again um, in the second part. And now let's move on to the second presentation. So we're going uh, in order of the exhibition's travel schedule. So the exhibition opened at the Van Gogh Museum uh, in the fall, and then it traveled to the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., and opened in February. Um, and that is where I work. I am Cecilia Wickman, the Publicity and Marketing Manager at the Phillips Collection. And um, first, I just want to really thank Sylvia for this fantastic idea. We've already learned so much from each other just in comparing notes about these uh, different approaches to interpreting the same show and hope to learn more from you all today. Um, as Sylvia and Edith both shared, this exhibition was really about how artists like the rest of us got incredibly excited about being able to capture their personal worlds through the camera. 
So at the Phillips, we focused in on how this was sort of a really accessible, um, connecting opportunity with the public, especially in the age of Instagram and Pinterest, and people are sort of experiencing the same sort of connectivity with photography anew through all of our mobile devices in the way that these snapshot artists were through the new handheld. On the flip side of that, I think like a week or two before the exhibition opened at the Phillips, Kodak's bankruptcy was official. Uh, so that provided a, a really poignant entry point, I think. On the opposite side, people were feeling nostalgic and connected to something that was passing away. Um, so we were thinking about both of those things um, when we uh, were trying to get the word out about the exhibition. And um, next slide. on to the next mm -hmm. slide. We thought about um, two things generally in, in our sort of outreach strategy. This exhibition is complicated. There were, I think, five artists involved and so many artworks. The Phillips, I don't know how many of you have ever been there. It's a sort of rather small museum, and so it was a real challenge for our staff to even fit the show into the galleries. Um, and there, was, uh, there were a lot of sort of complicated stories to connect with, so we wanted to help uh, the audience connect and clarify some of those ideas and through sort of ongoing efforts at the museum to empower uh, the public to co-create with us, we thought this would be sort of a great opportunity to continue some efforts we'd been doing recently a month before the show opened. We had started a, a yarn bombing project where the public knitted hearts with us and plastered the city for Valentine's Day and uh, we had done a flash mob recently and that sort of thing. So we were trying to build on those collaborative efforts. So um, our photo contest at the Phillips was a little bit different than both Indianapolis and the Van Gogh Museum in that its starting point was our ad campaign. Um, it, we were developing an ad campaign that involved print, display, and online. Um, so this is what uh, members of the public would see possibly before they had ever even heard of the exhibition, possibly before they had ever heard of the museum, certainly before they had been to the museum. So um, it, it needed to be a proposition to come check out the show um, and pique curiosity. So I mean, we heard at the keynote this morning a little bit about this idea of building a pre-experience, setting up con context um, for an exhibition that can uh, then help the public both decide to come visit the museum and, and have a more sort of emotionally connected experience once they're there. So this shows you a little bit of the creative from the campaign. On the uh, left side, you see one of the display ads with a QR code that uh, gave a mobile dimension to the contest. And on the right is one of our online banner ads. And um, our rich media campaign was the main way that our photo contest was delivered out to the public. So we had um, an online banner ad campaign that ran for four weeks. It was geo-targeted, so it was really only served to people in the DC area. Um, it was also behaviorally targeted. So we work with an ad agency at the Phillips called Wit Media in New York, and they helped us identify um, audiences that are prone to surfing the web um, in a way that shows that they're interested and invested in art and museums and specifically in photography. Um, and like I said, we linked it all together through the display and the print campaign with QR codes, so the mobile engagement ended up being sort of a smaller piece of the puzzle. We still thought it was important as a way of letting people know that we were doing this. If you want to click one more time, that shows you a banner. And what was interesting about this campaign, when you hovered over this ad on your browser, if it was served to you, instead of having to click through, you would get a microsite right there without having to navigate away from wherever you were in your sort of web browsing. And the site popped up. If you want to toggle around and play with this a bit, it's up on one of those laptops there. And you can check it out after the presentation. We wanted to build a pretty direct, interactive experience with some of the artwork in the show. So what a user would do is select one of these artworks in that sort of left rail. It populates the left screen there. So those are all paintings from the exhibition um, by a variety of the artists involved. And then in the right window, you could upload your own photo in response. In the mobile version, this was fed through uh, an external app called, um, what was it called, Pickup? Um, but mostly people participated from desktops and could upload directly from their computers. 
so these are what I call sort of slick methods. It was built with this ad agency, and we had a lot of sort of metrics returned to us. We didn't program any of the sort of contest pages internally at the museum. Um, the agency donated, donated a Nikon One camera for us to give to a winner. We decided that the winner would be randomly selected. The main rule was that you could only submit once. Um, and uh, the winner was randomly selected at the end of the exhibition. So this was served out for four weeks uh, at the middle of the exhibition. The winner did not find out until the exhibition closed in May. So These, no judging. There was no judging to this whatsoever. This was completely open-ended. And unless somebody sent something that was like, completely irrelevant to the uh, painting that they had selected, which I think happened maybe once. Um, we kept all of it and just shuffled them and picked one at random. So these are some of the examples. It was fun. You see two dog-related submissions. <laughs> um, and I think people had fun with it. For the most part, you could tell that people were drawing on photos that they had taken in the past rather than taking something new. Edith, we'll continue. Come back. And call back <laughs> okay, so the results are the results of the online ad campaign as well as the photo contest specifically. Um, we delivered, you know, over 15 and a half million impressions into the marketplace, um, and almost 15 percent of the people that saw this ad chose to expand it. Um, that's compared to a benchmark of 8% with ad campaigns in the cultural sector like this normally. So that was really, it, it must have been more than somebody accidentally hovering over it in there <laughs> on, a, on a web page. What was really, really remarkable from an advertising perspective was the fact that the average dwell time on this expandable contest page was over 81 seconds. It was almost 82 seconds. That's a really long time for interacting with an online ad. And the benchmark for that is 6.1 seconds. Um, we also, you know, linked to this contest page from our website and our social networks and such. Those people did not discover it through advertising. They got there directly one way or another. That was another 61,000 unique visitors and 150 um, unique mobile users navigated through those QR codes to the site, and we got 100 photo submissions. So in terms of, I think, the broad, we can talk more about evaluation at the end, but the broad scheme of photo contests, that's a relatively small output. But in terms of people off-site who had never seen the exhibition, interacting for the first time, participating, and working with advertising in that way, that's uh, sort of remarkably high output. And then this is a little bit of a disconnected stat, but we did exceed attendance projections at the exhibition at the museum over its full run by about 15%. So you can't link directly that advertising makes that kind of thing happen. It's all kinds of different factors, um, but we were sort of pleased with visitation at the museum. And that was our randomly selected winner. She won a camera. She was very happy. <laughs> OK, so on the other side, on the flip side, um, my colleagues in our education department wanted to expand on these themes through a public program and through a really in-depth um, crowdsourcing project that updated the themes of the exhibition for the present in a home movie contest. Um, One thing that was sort of specific about this is we, we have been trying at the Phillips to connect really deeply with local communities uh, in Washington, D.C. And like elsewhere, there's a really actively um, growing videographer and sort of filmmaking community in the city that we thought we could connect with in a specific, meaningful way um, by um, sort of updating the themes of the exhibition. So um, in this case, we decided to do something juried um, and something a little bit more involved. We were really kind of asking a lot of participants. Um, we set up a Google entry form, and we announced this home movie contest with a call to come see the exhibition, think about the way these artists were um, focusing on 
experimenting with images of the life at home with family and friends and also in sort of the public realm and then create a video along those same lines about the filmmaker's own personal life that is three minutes or less and tells a clear story. So we asked them to submit through a Google entry form, um, post a link to this video hosted elsewhere. It had to have all original content, which included music, so that was a little bit tricky for some people to find um, public domain music to use. We assembled a jury, uh, including an independent film curator in DC, the founder of the DC Shorts Film Festival, a style blogger with the Washington Post, which was a way of sort of expanding the reach and getting some coverage built in um, to the contest, and then our digital media manager, Michelle Herman at the Phillips Collection. We got 20 submissions. We were asking a lot, so we thought that that was decent. Um, and our jury selected 10 finalists. These 10 finalists were then screened at the museum, which we saw as sort of a, a prize in and of itself. It was a breakthrough moment to really be featuring um, on site at the museum original artwork by members of the public uh, in a meaningful way. And they also received a copy of the exhibition catalog. You can move to the next slide. So that shows you the screening. Um, it was really kind of cool because everybody who participated recruited their audience that they um, wanted to come and support them. That night there would be a vote and one crowd favorite would be selected um, as the ultimate winner of the competition. So you see the ballot boxes. Each of the participants got up and introduced their film. Um, there was voting at the end and then one winner was selected who turned out to be um, a young woman who was a student at the George Washington University, a partner of the Phillips. Uh, she created this great short uh, film about her family. Shows them all gathering around food. And it really did sort of bring something to life about the exhibition, about these very personal moments that the um, artist captured in their photos as well. And she received prizes of um, a screening during the DC Shorts Film Festival. She received a year-long membership to the Phillips Collection, uh, and she also received a $300 gift card to B&H Photo. So we were trying to shape prizes that would be really affirming and supportive to a young videographer, filmmaker. So the results on this one, we had over 1,000 um, unique visitors to post about this on our website and on the museum's blog. We had 20 video submissions, as I mentioned. 92 folks showed up for the screening at the Phillips, and the winner's video um, was screened to a crowd of about 400 at DC Shorts Film Festival. Um, and we did have sort of a a deep level of engagement by participants over a long period of time and built some lasting, meaningful partnerships in the process. So two very, very different approaches, both within one organization and from our two um, colleague organizations. Thinking about how we evaluate, um, you know, we felt like on the ad campaign front, we were doing something uh, in terms of digital advertising that was innovative with that expandable um, no-click banner, and it performed really well. Um, we put together an innovative collaborative program that was really about co-creating with the public. Um, exhibition attendance was strong, however loosely that's linked to doing this kind of uh, initiative. And um, like I said, deep level of participation. One thing that I am really thinking about as a result of putting this session together is the lack of a presence in the exhibition itself. These two initiatives were not, you know, you did not see anything about the opportunity to participate in either of these ways when you were walking through the exhibition. Um, they were really both promoted locally only, and I think an online photo contest is a brilliant moment to go national, global, and connect with people that cannot physically come to the show. And um, they were tough challenges. They both asked you to do a lot, even the ad campaign. Um, photo contest asked you to spend some time. Um, and we only gave one, well, I mean, we had 10 finalists in the video contest, but we really privileged one winner in both cases. So I think it might be interesting to think about how to um, give incentives for multiple winners in contests like these. Which is something that we try to do, at least in our case. Um, OK. Let's now launch a final presentation. Edith, are you still there? I'm still there. Or you can see us. 
sorry, that's, um, well, well, we'll go through the presentation and then we'll make sure that uh, you can see us uh, when we go into the questions. Um, I'm here, I'm to clear now. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, my name is Sylvia, um, I didn't introduce myself before, um, and I um, am a manager of evaluation and technology-based engagement at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And um, I'm here to talk about our experience with this um, online competition. We were the last venue to host the show, and with uh, the Van Gogh Museum and Phillips Collection come up, coming up with such a creative idea for this photo competition, we felt a little bit obliged to also follow up and do, um, and do one ourselves. Um, but despite the fact that we had some peer pressure, we also <laughs> felt that it was a really good, ex good opportunity for us to um, really try to develop new audiences, to engage visitors in different ways, and also to provide opportunities to include the voice of the visitors in the museum experience. These are goals that are set within our, str our strategic plan, so we thought that this was really a good, a, a good way for us to do this. This was important for us because we had sort of tried a couple of participatory projects before, um, mainly online through social tagging and allowing people to comment on a collection, which had not been very successful. So there was a little bit of, um, you know, um, new curators and other, you know, um, colleagues were a little bit hesitant about sort of this notion of participation. And we thought that this was the good project to start and try to do things right. So this was really important for us to do. So talking about the project, and by the way, these are some of the photos that were um, submitted. Um, we um, started developing it in April, um, so about two months, two and a half months before uh, the beginning of the, um, the the opening of the exhibition, and uh, it launched on June 8, which was the opening date of the exhibition. Um, the um, it, the exhibition ended September 2nd, and so did the competition officially, even though the website still exists and is out there now for uh, people to um, use. And we've had actually use even after um, the competition ended. Uh, the project was a collaboration between different departments. Uh, it was promoted by my department, Audience Engagement, in collaboration with Marketing and the Curatorial Department. But it, then it was in, developed by the IMA Lab, which is our sort of web um, team. The, web, the project, the um, competition had two main components, an online component, which basically was m the main functionality was to allow people to submit a photo. So we had an online form where people had to indicate their name, their email address, the title of the photo, upload the image according to specific size requirements, and we'll explain why the size requirements were necessary. And we also asked them to tag the image so that other people could find it more easily. Um, we uh, also allowed people to send, if they wanted, the email, the photo by email. Uh, unfortunately, with um, iPhone, uh, you cannot um, sort of fill up the form online and sort of upload automatically the photo from the form. So we wanted to give people the possibility that people that had an iPhone, iPhone and had taken the photo with an iPhone to just send us directly um, the photo. And we asked them, obviously, to add the title and the tags in the photo. We did not receive that many emails, but we did receive a few. Most of the photo were submitted through the online form. Um, the second thing that people could do on, our, on the website was to browse through um, the photos that were submitted. And there were different ways of doing it. They could view the most popular, most recent, and most viewed. They could also search for a specific photo on a topic or a photographer. Um, or they could browse the, the most popular tags that were um, sort of associated with the photos. So we created multiple ways of being, allowing people to view um, the photos. We, um, each photo had its own page, and we offered a bunch of functionality on the photo page. People could vote, and the vote here was not, re didn't require um, uh, to have a Facebook account, everybody could vote. People could embed it, could share it, and they could also flag. People, submission were sent straight live. We chose not to moderate before, so um, we want to use the flag um, functionality as a way to being sort of warned that there might be some photos that were problematic. We did not have many problem at all during the course of the competition. People could also comment on the photo, and in this case, we decided to use Facebook Connect, so the Facebook API. And the reason why we did that is because by writing a comment here, the comment would appear on a person's um, Facebook page, and so all of their friends could see it, and that could create and generate potentially a lot of traffic to our website. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. People could also see related videos, which were videos by the same photographer or with similar tags. Now, we also chose some 
particularly interesting or beautiful photos and we uh, feature them on the homepage on a slideshow at the top. Um, five of them would rotate and then if people refresh the page, the page other five would be shown. And these photos that were um, featured on this rotator would also appear inside the museum. So they would be projected here automatically uh, just at the exit of the exhibition so that people that visited the exhibition but also people that did not necessarily visit the exhibition could see the photos that had been submitted, could read about the competition and pick up a little flyer there that they could take home with them and then decide to, they could even decide to send something then and there if they had a phone with them or they could just go home and then sort of pick the photo or take a new photo and submit it. So there was, as, um, as Edith did at the Van Gogh Museum, there was an on-site component for this. We wanted to make this a promotion. Yes? Um, how, how did you choose which ones? Um, we had a motor, uh, we had a, a website editor and she would just pick, it was just a oh, personal so choice. Good. Yeah, okay. it wasn't uh, necessarily uh, any criteria here. Um, we, during the course of the competition, uh, we added a jury, uh, a jury of professionals, either from the museums as well as photographers. And this jury was meeting every month and they were selecting three winners every month. So we had a total of nine winners, which meant that people submitted some photos in the first month and then tried again on the second month. It was a way to incentivize people to come back the second and the third month of the competition. And also, we, um, allow, we uh, at the end of the competition, we uh, awarded prize to the three most popular votes, the, the, the voters that had the, most, um, the highest amount of popular votes. Um, prizes that could win include digital camera, gift cards for Robert's camera, which is a photography store in town, and they also have an online component, so even if people were not from Indianapolis, they could have purchased the product online, and then also free exhibition tickets. Um, we, um, the project was successful. We will see later a few numbers so that you can kind of get a sense of how it went, but we did, it didn't come without challenges. Um, I think that the, probably the biggest challenge, which is something that we were expecting, but um, you know, um, so we were prepared, but that it did require a certain degree of maintenance every day. Um, we had to check the photos that were submitted, we had to make sure that nothing was submitted that was kind of, you know, had nudity or potentially could offend people. Uh, we need to monitor the comments that people made. We need to check if people had flagged anything and just double check that it wasn't anything offensive. We had to manually upload the emails, the photos that were sent by email. Um, so there were um, a lot of work that was involved, even getting in touch with the jury, making sure that you know they would meet, look at the picture. So it did require about an hour, an hour and a half of work every day, which is something that I could not afford. So we had an intern working specifically on this project. Um, there were a couple of technical issues that we had to face. Um, for some reason, some photos were uploaded and they appeared rotated. So it was something that certain cameras or certain phones had and their set up. So we had people would upload them and it would appear rotated compared to how it looked on their desktop. So they would flag it and then upload another one and try different attempts or email us. So we needed to figure out how to fix that for specific uh, photos that were taken with uh, specific equipment. We also had a problem which we never got to the end of, but sometimes a photo would appear twice. And it was not uploaded twice, but it would just appear twice in the list of entries. It had exactly the same views, exactly the same votes, so it was the same photos, and we could not figure out why. So we had to manually delete it every time that that was happening, but that required more maintenance. Um, we also had, um, we didn't put any limitation no themes, no number of photos limitation. So we had a lot of people that submitted a lot of photo, and some of them were very, very, very similar to each other. One woman uploaded 49 photos of a three series. So that meant that there was a lot of very similar photos that people had to go through. And that was one of the things that in hindsight we would have probably, like they did, limited to, or Van Gogh did, limited to a certain number of photos. Um, the other problem that we faced a little bit, um, we really loved the Facebook Connect, and we'll show you some numbers afterwards. But one of the problem is that by commenting, when a person commented using Facebook Connect, there was no way for us to tell the photographer that the person had commented, unless the photographer had himself or herself posted a message and the person was responding to that message. And that was a little bit sad because I think we could have seen a lot more exchange and communication between the photographers and the people that really had the comment, but because there was no way to do it very quickly, we were not able to see that as much of that communication as we might have sort of wanted to see. Let's look at some number and see sort of how it went. Um, so we had a total of 2,681 photos submitted over uh, the more or less, it was a little less than three months period of the competition. 
uh, by 552 photographers. So we had photographers really coming back month after month to try to post more photos and try to get a chance to win the next time around. And the average number is 4.9 uh, photos for, per photographer. Like, just like in uh, Edith's case, the second month was the most um, popular, so the one with the highest number of photos. But we still saw a decent number in August, which meant that we could sustain the attention for the three months of the competition. We wanted to know more. These numbers were not enough for us. We wanted to really understand who participated, who they are, how they found out about it, are they happy with the experience, why did they participate it. So we, and we used two main tools to be able to answer these questions. Um, first, Google Analytics, and then second, we did a survey on the web website, on the competition website. We would have, a, when a person came in, we had a slider appear and asking if they wouldn't mind answering a few questions about their experience on the website at the end of their visit, and we also gave a camera away. One camera was selected amongst the people that participated to the survey, so there was a little incentive to get them to answer the question. We had a, a total of 272 responses, um, so that was about a 6% margin of error, which is a fairly representative sample of, um, of the visitors. So who participated? These are some general numbers. We had, I'm sorry, uh, Edith is covering, but we had 33,000 visitors over, uh, to the website over the um, three months period. And this corresponded to 15,000 unique visitors. The exhibition at 11,000 visitors. So we had more visitors to the exhibition web, to the competition website than to the exhibition itself. So that was a, really a way for us to expand to a completely new audience. We had some peaks generally, and they tend to correspond to the end of the month when you know people were trying to get the photos in to participate to the first uh, selection. Um, so there were some kind of trends that um, we were seeing. We um, also try, one of the goal of the objective was try to see really if we could reach a new audience through this type of experience. So we did compare um, sort of the residents, the place of residence of the people that came to the exhibition and those that participated in uh, the competition. And as you can see, um, the competition is in blue, the exhibition is in red. We reach a much wider audience in terms of where these people are come from. Um, most of them were, yes, from Indianapolis, but we had a much higher number of people from the rest of Indiana, neighboring states, the US, and a little higher also number from abroad. So we actually were able to reach a wider population in this respect through the competition. Gender. Wise, uh, in both cases, it's a very much of a female <laughs> audience. I mean, most of our visitors to the museum are female, and also to our exhibitions. And this was the same also for the competition, which did not necessarily attract more male audiences. It attracted female audiences. When it comes to ethnicity, um, we were also um, able, through the competition, to attract a slightly more diverse audience. So the majority of them were still Caucasian, but there was a slightly higher number of uh, um, African Americans. Um, Latinos, Asians, so we were able to get a slightly wider um, reach in terms of ethnicity as well as in terms of residence. Next question is how did people find out about uh, the exhibition? Uh, we um, asked them um, on the survey and the majority of them found out through somebody else, word of mouth. If you look at the top, we also asked them whether they found out through social media and specific in general and IMA social media in particular, those numbers those number are high. But we also know that people that said someone told me about it also included people that found out through social media. Some people were not able to really necessarily make that distinction. So I would say word of mouth, social media were the strongest pull. Um, but also I think it's interesting to see that this flyer and the slideshow at the end of the exhibition were successful in making people aware of this. Um, of this. So in that respect it was a successful um, um, tool. Um, we looked at the website traffic and the interesting thing is that the majority of the traffic was referral traffic. 42% came through another website and 91% of this 42% came from Facebook. So the Facebook Connect was what drove the traffic. We didn't do marketing campaigns at all. We had a little promo on our homepage, which was there some days yes, some days no. We had a little promo on the exhibition microsite, but that was pretty much it. All the traffic and all the people found out it mostly through Facebook because somebody posted an image and asked their friend to vote for it, and that drove all of the traffic. So this was really, really very, very successful for us in this respect. Can I ask one quick question? 
Sure. So what's the percentage of Facebook mobile? It's 30. 30 yeah, 30 of this. And actually, I deleted the slide because there was no time. But we compared the mobile usage um, on this site compared to our general IMA website. This was um, about 30%. Our website is about 17 to 20%. So there was a lot more mobile traffic. And this was thanks to f Facebook mobile. It was thanks to the nature, maybe, of the competition because people had their photo. But also, it was also the fact that we had a responsive a website that had a responsive design, which we don't have on our website, so people could navigate the, um, the mobile site um, more easily. So that probably incentivized them to come back. So there were definitely um, sort of advantages to have a responsive website. Now, um, uh, let's see how people use the website. Um, the average time that people spent on the site, according to Google Analytics, is five uh, minutes which is quite a lot. If we look at the number of pages, it's also seven page um, per visit. These numbers are a little bit distorted by the fact that our staff was going to a website on almost a daily basis and trying to make sure that, you know, check that, you know, there were nothing that was inappropriate there. So those numbers are cer certainly probably an overestimation. But I think that the interesting thing is that we had 60% of our visitors who were returning visitors. And when we asked them in the survey how often they came back, we had 27% of people that came back daily to check if people had posted comments, if people had voted for their photo, and see what the situation was like. So um, looking at what people did on the website, um, we, most of them came to browse. Uh, view individual photos or submit photos, but we also see the more kind of advanced functionalities such as uh, voting and commenting and embedding were also used. Particularly voting was uh, popular amongst the visitors, so we had lots of people voting. So it was good because even the sort of more advanced functionality of the site were um, used. Satisfaction. People were extremely satisfied with the experience. This is on a scale of one to five. So the overall satisfaction was a 4.49, and particularly people seemed to appreciate the quality of the photo that were submitted. We really were surprised. We got a lot of the same sometimes, a lot of pets, a lot of kids, a lot of photo holiday photos, but a lot of very good quality photo. We were really, really surprised. It was really hard for the jury to pick. Uh, we had long deliberation because there was a lot of very good material that we didn't really expect including this, which is my favorite one. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about it later. Now, these numbers are certainly positive. We had a very good response. We had good level of satisfaction from people. We were able to extend the reach of our institution by attracting new audience. But we also wanted to do how well we did in terms of the objective that we had initially set. And our objectives were not so much number-based, but we had identified some outcomes, some learning outcomes that we want from this experience. And so at the end, we kind of looked at the data that we collected and see how well we were able to respond to the learning outcomes that we had set for this, um, ex this project. The first thing that we wanted to achieve when the, the competition was really trying to, we were hoping that this would help participants and visitors to understand that their own photographs were the modern day version and parallel of what those photos were in the exhibition. If we looked at the open-ended feedback that people gave in the survey, we noticed that 11% of them really were able to make this connection and clarify that they saw this parallel and that's why the competition was interesting for them. 15% um, of them mentioned the fact that they thought that just like the painters and the artists, their photo represented their life and it was a way for them to communicate their vision of the world. A few of them also commented a, that it was really useful to see at the end of the exhibition all of a sudden these photos because it was really a way for them to see how technology and how the photography technique had changed over time. They sort of had gone through this trip in time and then they came out of it and the, the fact of being faced with the new <laughs> snapshots, what today's snapshot was really a way to sort of think about how things had changed over time. So in this respect, we thought, felt that this objective was met the second objective that we had was trying to inspire analytical and critical thinking through commenting and voting. When we looked at the comments that people left, we have 11% of the photos that had a comment. We actually were hoping for 5%, so this was more than what we had expected. When we looked and analyzed the comments that people left, we had 83, so the majority of them were general comments. I love it, please vote for me, this is a great photo. So it's sort of very general, encouraging messages or marketing messages. But we also had 35% of people that left deeper messages that were about the composition, the color, the light, the technique, questions that they wanted answers to. So this was really showing that it wasn't just 
this is great, but people just went a little deeper and tried to kind of find more meanings in the photo that other people had submitted. The third outcome that we had in mind was we were hoping that this competition would develop, would help develop a more positive attitude towards the museum from the part of the visitor as a more you, engaging and sort of inclusive experience. 12% of the people commented that they found that this was a very interesting way of engaging the audience, so they saw this in a positive way. And particularly, they appreciated the fact that the museum could offer, a, offer a platform where people could share their work and their own experience and see what other people are doing. So in that respect, it worked very well in sort of changing the reputation of our museums and make it look more fun and more engaging and more um, inclusive. Fourth objective was to really stimulate part the participants' creativity um, and also potentially use the IMA as a source of inspiration. We had 22% of the people that commented and said how they felt that they were inspired by this competition. Uh, by looking at other pictures, uh, but also themselves, 12% of those that submitted a photo said that they, cre they took the photo specifically for the competition. And 60 of them tags those photos as IMA or Indianapolis Museum of Art. So the museum itself became a source of inspiration for these people. Um, last objective that we had in mind was to try to motivate people to come to the exhibition and to eventually take part in photography-related events. 22% um, of them really declared that they really was a source of inspiration for them, as particularly inspiring them to want to know more about uh, photography. 57 um, declared that they were planning to see the show. Only about 50% of the people that responded to the survey had come to the show, and the remaining 50 seemed to be willing to or interested in going and see the show or participating in an event that was offered par in parallel to the show to just learn about photography and generally 44% plan to learn more about photography. So we felt that we were successful in not only driving traffic to the exhibition website, but also driving, potentially driving traffic to the exhibition and just a general interest in photography. So this is it. Yes? Regarding the results of the yeah. pre-selected pre uh, Choices that the users were able to do or no, to these were just wording, open-ended. Wor okay, no, uh, these yes were pre-selected choices. The inspires interest in photography. All the other previous were just open-ended survey that, responses that we coded so you went in through and, and coded it. Yes. <laughs> so this is it. So for us, it was an overall a very good experience um, in terms of participation, satisfaction, expanding our audience, and also meeting all the outcome that we had set um, before this experience. So here we are. <laughs> uh, we have a bunch of questions that we have come up with that we were hoping that each of the participants could answer. And then we thought we would open it to the audience for some questions. OK? So Edith, are you still there? Hello? <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Um, we cannot hear you. No, let me see. Shall I call you back? Sorry? Okay. Well, let's see. Sorry. Is there an IM function? I, it's not even my computer, oh, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. Can I ask a quick question to the room? How many of you have done interactive photo competitions at your own site before? Successful? I mean, what are. It was just a pilot project did it last year, but it was successful. So now I've been granted sort of the budget to do something. It. Oh, cool. Um, is it was extremely successful, but only on a personal level. Uh, it was geared towards kids. Uh, I had no budget, and the prize was uh, it was nature photography. The, the prize would come in and be museum photographer a day for a day, mm -hmm. take photos in, of an artifact, and then learn how to large scale print it. Okay. So the kids that won were just so stoked on photography that yeah, they're they're really happy. But it was limited to about I think had about forty five. Uh, Anybody else? Maybe after this? <laughs> after this, we didn't have a photography contest. We actually had a poetry contest. And, um, 
response to, we had a favorite sculpture that was leaving our sculpture park and uh, kids loved it. And so we, we actually broke it out by age groups and had multiple uh, age groups submit poems. And then the prize was basically to come in, meet with the artist, and then read your poem aloud to the collective group. So okay. that was successful on her. Yes? Uh, we've done the, the photo contest or something like that before, and it's been kind of mediocre, I think. From in terms of the what was submitted? work that went in versus the mm -hmm. response back you know, from our people. But we did do a, a photo caption. We had a photography exhibition. I can't remember his name right now. But uh, we, would, we had the rights to put the images on Facebook, and people could write their own captions. And that seemed to be pretty good. OK. As far as uh, user engagement. I think this is sort of. I think this kind of leads nicely to maybe sort of why we think, first of all, was it successful and why do we think this was successful? I mean, if I have to think about the experience that we had, we think it's successful, but what really made it successful was that really people had a personal connection with this. Um, whenever we asked them to participate to things before, it was about things that mattered to us and not things that matter to them. And here it's really something that is their hobby, it's their, their personal life, their families. They're sharing something about themselves with us and they, and they feel a personal connection with it. Um, so that was definitely one of the reasons why I felt that this project was successful compared to other projects, the participatory project that we'd done. I think another element was the fact that people could see themselves mm -hmm. immediately, like could see what they had, um, okay. She disconnected again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the fact that um, people could really see what they uploaded straight there and there, and there was no filter, so they could go back and check what other people had to say. Um, sorry. That I'll actually, yeah, that's a really good lead in. I mean, I felt like I'm glad that we did both of the projects that we did at the Phillips. We learned a lot from them, and for the people who participated deeply, I think they were successful, kind of like what you were saying. Um, but I, I think that we missed some things, especially in terms of audience engagement and participation, not only this in-gallery component and really making it part of the exhibition, that's really empowering when you feel like the participatory piece is part of the exhibition. And sometimes in a museum that can be harder to negotiate with your curatorial and education colleagues, sometimes not. But the main thing I think is what Sylvia is talking about, this immediate seeing your own work and seeing all of the other participants. Those give it a shot images. I mean, at the very end of the competition, a, a blog ran all of them and we ran all of them, but you didn't see it being aggregated and added to and new photos coming up today and you didn't see your own after you had submitted it. And with the home movie contest, it was the same thing. You got to go to the museum and see this great screening, but there wasn't this, and that's what sort of the online world is perfect for doing, this ongoing building, aggregate, commenting, sharing. I think that's core to success. So Edith, do you have any uh, sort of uh, insight into why you thought that the exhibition, the experience was successful for you guys? Uh, well, we had uh, lots of enthusiastic participants. Uh, people were very eager to see the photo, and all when we uh, we post uh, of them on uh, on Facebook, and uh, noticed people were very enthusiastic in uh, in uh, liking and commenting on the photos. And just the enthusiasm of the very different subjects people uh, photographed in, uh, in Amsterdam. And that uh, that was love to see what was, what was uh, uh, submitted. Sorry. And I think uh, the engagement uh, of this competition was uh, was quite high. Uh, there. So did you all hear she she's remarking on the enthusiasm and the level of engagement no, was very here. high. I don't know if this will work, but Edith, I was also curious. You mentioned, yeah, it might not work. I was just curious about that piece she talked about, um, really bringing their sponsors in terms of the city of Amsterdam into the loop. That I think that's an interesting idea for a museum, and whether it was successful in, in sort of building a relationship with those important tourism sponsors. Do you hear this? Uh, now, could you Edith, did you find that um, your sponsors in terms of the tourism partners were 
got a lot out of this as well? Or, or were good partners? Um, sorry again. Um, I, I couldn't understand that because it sounds quite uh, poor. Okay. <laughs> Maybe move on to the next. <laughs> well, let's just move on to the next. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so let's say we do, Cecilia. What did you like the most about other people's initiative? <laughs> like, um, like the way that Van Gogh approached the project, the way that uh, the IMA approached the project? Well, I like the way that the Van Gogh Museum made it local. I mean, I think that that's a really interesting strategy. At the same time that, you know, I'm saying for the Phillips, I wish we had sort of made it more national and global, I like the idea of creating some kind of hook that it's, it's about your experience in the city. Um, it's a way to get people thinking, makes it a little bit easier, makes it a little bit more immediate. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the way, I mean, I think you all did so many things, right, at Indianapolis. I like the way the um, participant sharing with their friends and sharing with their sort of networks was so built into the process. I think it's so smart to make it wide open and trust people to do something really interesting with it. I think the results sort of speak for themselves in terms of, yeah, getting, giving people a chance and a platform to, to share what they're actually interested in. As far as um, I am concerned, I have to be honest with you, for us, this project was really sort of testing the water for interest out there for participatory experiences. We were burned before, so we just wanted to kind of test out the water. And we um, were not as brave, I feel, as both the Van Gogh and the uh, Philips collection were in connecting it to the exhibition. We didn't ask people to submit based on themes or the themes of the exhibition, or we didn't ask them to submit based on a photo or a painting in the exhibition because we felt we were a little bit worried that this would limit um, the submission. And we really wanted to sort of understand if there was a market or a pos like an interest for our participation. I would say that in hindsight, I would have really liked to connect it a little bit more directly with the exhibition, either, you know, like they did where it's about these are the paintings here, or these are the photos, and this is what, and making people create something that was in response to that, or you know, using the themes of the exhibition as a way to sort of guide uh, the submissions. So in that respect, I say that I appreciated those two aspects of um, my fellow colleagues. Now, Edith has turned green. <laughs> you look green on our screen, Edith. <laughs> Do you hear us? Hello? <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you have maybe um, something that you liked about um, the way that the IMA and the Phillips Collection approached the project? I come here. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're gonna. We might have to give up. <laughs> we'll give this aspect up. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't know what else to do. Um, yeah. This is what happens with technology. <laughs> There's probably everybody else who's now online, and so the network connection is probably not as effective. Um, but in Edith's presentation, she does include her contact information. So. so. If there's And at this point, I'm really happy that we pre-recorded the previous yeah. exhibition <laughs> because it would have been a lot more of a disaster. What, have you would have, what would you have done differently, Cecilia? I would have pushed to have a way for participants to see what was happening through, I think especially with the video competition, because I think that's the one that um, I am proud of in terms of the sort of meaningful content. I feel like um, if you could have seen what some of the other videos were that, that were submitted before you submitted yours, you'd be inspired and um, uh, the barrier to entry would be a little bit lower since we were asking so much of people. Mm -hmm. As far as we're concerned, I would say that there's two main things. One was what I mentioned before, limiting maybe the number of submissions so that we would have less of the same photos that people had to go through and also the jury had to sort of go through. And the other thing would be, one thing that I realized, I went to a conference like sort of three weeks before the end of the competition and there was a presentation there about a group um, that is doing um, a research on techniques to help facilitating conversation online through blogs and comments. And I really learned a lot of interesting 
sort of suggestions on how to stimulate the conversation, have moderators in this sort of sort of environment and then have them ask certain questions in a way that it would stimulate the conversation. And really when I came back, I said, I really want to do this, but then you know, we did not really have the chance to do it. So in the future, if we do a participatory project, I would really try out these techniques to have a moderator there every once in a while, ask people questions and see if it really stimulates the conversation and make it a little deeper and, and more engaged experience for, for visitors. Um, um, we want to talk a little bit about what we learned from mm -hmm. this experience, the single most important thing. Um, I think I learned that I work at a place that is totally ready and excited about doing this and that we should push it further. Um, start earlier, enlist the right allies. I think um, that a project that's really collaborative with your colleagues always works better. Um, and in, in the case of the home movie contest, it was part of a strategic programming initiative with our educators. And if instead of doing this marketing photo contest and this home movie contest and splitting our, our energies that way, if we had very far in advance sort of enlisted the curators of the project and the educators and all focused on one integrated project that they could sort of craft content-wise and we could promote, I think that we would have um, just had higher engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I would say there is one most important learning for the museum and one most important learning for me, and are not necessarily the same. I felt already before that there was a market and an interest uh, for participatory experience, but people at the museum didn't necessarily feel that way. So I would say that for them, the biggest learning in this experience is really that there is an interest out there. People want to share their experience, and we should, as an organization, find a platform to include those experiences in our museum. For me, I would be saying the biggest surprise on this was Facebook, was really sort of you know how this drives traffic, this drives interest, drives comment. I was not really expecting this kind of response and it's something that it's really been successful and as a result we've decided to adopt in other projects for instance where we're doing we're redesigning our bubble at the moment and we are instead of allowing the just general commenting we're going to um, use the same Facebook connect or API and hopefully that will drive more traffic to um, the website why did you decide not to use Facebook likes as a way of voting you built your own voting method we um, we thought about it. We felt, okay, there's two levels in which people can participate. Mm -hmm. Voting is the most simple, and we want to open it to everybody without sort of putting a limit to the commenting. The commenting is something more sophisticated that people need to kind of already be used to and adapted to, and that's kind of the Facebook audience already. So we felt that it was okay for us to allow the commenting and sort of forcing people to have a Facebook account to be able to comment, but we didn't necessarily want to do that with the voting because we felt that we wanted maybe to allow people that didn't necessarily have one to vote. It's sort of a just more general um, sort of functionality while the commenting was a slightly more sophisticated and engaged response, which I think it was okay to do with people that um, were um, at Facebook because they were already used to that. Whether or not you had any um, negative feedback from people about being forced to comment through their Facebook identity. No, the only sort of negative feedback that we had was that people did not like the most popular photos. <laughs> Those were not the most beautiful photos out there. Uh, but you know, we wanted to give people the chance people that had a good network of people to win something. So that was the only negative comment that we had. There was nothing in there saying, well, n there was nothing in the survey, because that's why, we, obviously, if you didn't have a Facebook account, you would not be able to comment that you were not happy with it. But in the survey, there was nothing that said, why did you allow commenting through Facebook? And, you know, not like that. Nobody mentioned it. Maybe somebody got turned off by that. I don't know. But if they didn't get to annoyed to a point that they would tell, let us know through a survey. So that's kind of the only information that I have. I also think building off of what you just said, one thing that was really successful about what you all did was building in the juried component and the public vote comment. And with the home movie contest, we found that too. It's, it's work to work with a jury, but it's very nice to sort of layer the different ways that things are judged to give a sort of more open playing field. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I, I would be curious to know if that is similar or different to what happens on October. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Were like, you actually getting a higher percentage of people who were commenting because they're thinking, I'm talking about a museum thing, mm -hmm. therefore, you know, sort of exhibiting a different degree? To be honest with you, I'm not really sure. I have one question that we should have asked in the exhibition, in the, in the survey, but we didn't. I'm not really sure that necessarily people that came to vote, they realized the connection with the with the museum necessarily. We had links to the exhibition website. All, this was a microsite that we developed, and we had links all over the page to the exhibition. It was at the top, it was at the, it was in the, in the, in the wording, it was in the bottoms, but I'm not really sure that everybody necessarily, um, you know, made a connection, oh, this is a museum, so I have to be more careful and more thoughtful into kind of the kind of comment that I provide. I don't, I'm not really sure, uh, necessarily, especially people that were coming through mobile, to mobile devices, I think those links would have probably been a little bit more lost, and I'm not really sure that people um, sort of thought, oh, this is really sort of, I think that what pushes people to make more thoughtful comment is that their name is associated to them, to that. Like when you have anonymous commenting, you kind of, you know, you can be a little bit more sloppy, you can be a little bit more critical, you know, it's not associated to you and it's not going to appear on your wall, on your Facebook page. So I think that people were, uh, the fact that, you know, um, your name and your face is associated to what you're saying can pushes people to be a little bit more careful and thoughtful into the way that they frame um, their comments. Do you want to throw the slideshow up just so we have some yeah, sorry. Um, photos to look at? I think Edith is gone. I'm going to call her back in a minute. But um, sorry, this is not the one. I have a question about um, if you had any policy for people that posted photos of other people, and those other people would see that they are in a photo and they don't want themselves mm -hmm. on display. It was addressed in our terms and condition, so that people need to make sure that they had the right to um, basically display the photo, you know, some make sure, and then it was their responsibility if we didn't. I mean, the only way we could do it was protecting ourselves um, from this and making sure that that was clearly stated in the terms and condition, and people had to approve the terms and condition to be able to submit. Um, and if people sent us the photo by an email, they had to enter in the email, I agree with the terms and condition, uh, which were, um, so it was more of a way to protect yourself in case mm -hmm. somebody um, did, and that's kind of as far as we went. Could, could I comment on that quick, because that, that came up with us. Uh, we have really strict privacy laws in or for the government in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, but one of the ways we get around that is using Facebook specifically to host these contests, because there, there is uh, now an exception for social media, so if someone mm -hmm. posts on a social media platform, it's recognized that that's, it's, it's out there. It's, it's not our responsibility that that photo of that person is there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm at yeah. the university again, so we have a lot of privacy yeah. issues. So yeah, Facebook actually is a great that's way really to work around those mm -hmm. privacy issues. In all cases, you hosted the images yourself on the website of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Did you consider using the Twitter? Yeah, we actually did, um, but we wanted to really have the flexibility of allowing people to search, browse in more sort of structured way. We felt that with Flickr, it would have been a, a little bit more, um, that functionality would have been a little bit more limited. So um, we, um, um, we um, decided to go down that path. We actually talked to the Van Gogh Museum first because they had done Flickr um, competitions before, and they actually had told us that those experiences were not very successful, while well, mm -hmm. this experience was very successful. So also following up on that, we felt that it was um, more safer to um, host them on our own platform. And, yeah. They, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm at the mat. We, we used to do Flickr contests, and we were actually really successful with them, but Flickr changed their terms and services about a year and a half to two years ago. To not allow contests where there is a prize given um, on their site. So you, to do a contest on Flickr, you have to not be giving anything away, um, which is not the kind of contest that we want to do. We're not doing contests. We're just doing ongoing interactions. We're not winning prizes, just opportunities for people. Yeah, we did. 
We did a number of things with Flickr, um, both like just setting up groups and encouraging tagging in a certain vein. Uh, we had a Christo and Jean Claude exhibition, and we were getting people to share, you know, photos that they had taken at different public projects around the world. And we did a photo contest about three years ago with a Mirandi exhibition, a painter who does these beautiful still lives of bottles, where it was a make your own Mirandi and photograph it, again, asking for a lot of work <laughs> from people. And it was, it was successful, again, in this sort of local, um, deep engagement way that our contest this time. But I think, yeah, Flickr doesn't let you do prizes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know as a threshold on a staff tone. That's what I'm using right now. Yeah. For, yeah. It, it, it makes sense. I, it makes sense. I, I mean, I don't know. I think that um, we wanted to do the simpler, this was the most simple thing. Sorry, guys. Do you want to? <laughs> well, in our case, we it was all part of this sort of a banner ad situation, so we weren't using any of those public platforms anyway. I think it would have been a great idea to do so, and we're talking a lot about how Instagram could play into a, a Facebook interactive contest in the future. I think we also, I, I want to go back to what I said before about we wanted it to limit, but as many, as little barrier as possible to everybody uploading. So um, we felt that um, if we could those do find a way to integrate those platform with the online submission, with everything, then it would have been great because it would have increased the potential. But it wouldn't be the only way because we felt that you know there was a group of people that would have been cut off from from that um, from that type of experience. So the only way we could do it is by finding a way to integrate all of those platform with the online submission uh, and the email and. Probably if we had had the time, we would have done it, and we just, you know, opted for the most simple option. On the other hand, you have the built-in community of shutterbugs. Mm -hmm. who are really willing to and used to engage in online communities. The way we tap into that community is with the Facebook. The way we tapped into that community is with the Facebook commenting. That's kind of, we try to bring that in in that way. Um, I know, we looked into those, yeah. but actually we were lucky, and well, the site is built on Drupal, and the submission form is actually a um, piece of development that was done by, by the Balboa um, uh, Online Cooperative as part of the, one of these grants that they have to create um, open source tools. Um, so we used that module for the form, and then the rest of the site was developed in Drupal, which is what we use for um, other initiatives. So. I think that it's not, I mean, I'm sure that we can, but yeah. I think Balboa Park is probably the sort of original source of that code. Um, I'm not sure how much we added to that. Um, I'm sure that we can definitely talk about it, but um, yeah, I think- it's really nice and clean, and I could imagine it being used in a bunch of different ways for, for different museums without it necessarily being something that you have to pay for or something. No, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we try to make it as simple and basic as possible. Yes. Hi there. Um, I'm uh, interested in how how um, both of you see the ongoing life cycle of the content of these. And, and I guess a, a related question is why you went with a microsite rather than another way of you know, integrating with your main website or even with your collection. I think that would have been a much harder battle to have with the curators. I think for me, really trying to get the curators to accept the fact that we wanted to even have a space within the museum for the visitor, visitors created art um, or contribution was the first battle. The, the battle that I wanted to win 
on this front. Yeah. I had to, you have to pick and choose. <laughs> and this was the one that I wanted. It was a battle that we lost initially. Uh, we wanted the projector to be inside the exhibition. We wanted to create a reading space and then people would sit down, look at the catalog, look at the various books that were um, sort of available in the reading space and then sort of see the photos then. Um, the curators was very much against the idea and the notion of introducing the projection of those photos inside the exhibition. So we uh, had a compromise in the end and we put it just outside at the exit, which actually turned out to be better because we could capture all the visitors that were not going to the exhibition. Um, our museum is free and then um, the exhibition costs $12, so a lot of people don't necessarily get to go to the exhibition. So that was the kind of battle that I um, wanted to kind of win <laughs> here. Um, I think that introducing those um, images on our website more permanently integrating with the collection would have been a l much, much wider discussion and much more political mm -hmm. discussion to, to win. Um, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, it's necessarily the best idea, but I guess if you have, if you have any co comments on how you s saw the, the long term okay. uh, life of this. We actually, as far as we're concerned, we're leaving the content out there um, for now. We don't have any plan to take those photos away. Um, uh, we see that there is a little bit of black traffic still going to the site. Um, and actually, the three most popular photos that were fo popular at the end of the competition are no longer the three most popular photos. So there is still voting and activity going on. I am actually... I don't know. I'm in the process of actually working on a project, a participatory project that reuses content that was developed in another participatory project at another museum. Mm. So God knows, <laughs> maybe one of you will come and knock on my door one day and might want to use some of these photos uh, for other purposes. So why not leave it out there? Um, I think that a, a couple of comments that I got from people were that people really love some of the photos and they were really thinking of turning them into um, printing them on t-shirts and turning them into posters and if I could put them in touch with the photographer that made them those photos. So I think there is a, an interest to keep that content out there and sort of become sort of a, potentially an intermediary between these people and the public. And that seems especially possible given the open-ended framework of your competition, I think. For us, it was so connected. Both, both projects were so connected with the temporary exhibition yeah. that I think we conceived of them as finite. Um, I mean, we're still in touch with the winner of the home movie contest and excited that she's launched her site and just showed at DC Shorts and that sort of thing, but it's not really propagated by the museum in any way. And we are thinking now about interactive projects that can have a longer, more integrated life by focusing on the collection in some way. Um, we have a major exhibition coming up of American work from the Phillips collection that will be twice the run of a normal exhibition and a great way to sort of dig in and do lots of sort of collaboration and interpretation on artworks that will be at the museum forever. So we're thinking in those terms now, I think. Cool. Any more question? Okay. Edith, are you still there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry this didn't work out as planned. <laughs> Do you want to kind of, I don't know if you were able to catch some of the questions that were asked by um, people here in the audience. Do you have some final maybe remarks that you want to sort of share with uh, the people here? Uh, well, I understood very few questions because, uh, well, the sound was very uh, of poor, very poor quality, but I think uh, if you start a, a competition, doesn't matter if it is a photo competition or something else, uh, make sure you teach it to yourself. That's, that's a great learning point uh, uh, we, we, uh, we learned because uh, uh, our competition took a lot of uh, handling uh, during the uh, competition and uh, that's not, not it takes away the fun in, in um, organizing such a thing and we find out that three months is way too long to hold the attention and I think if you keep it simple and make it easy to yourself and have a short uh, time span then uh, and, and using Tools like Facebook is, is very it's a very great tool because uh, uh, especially if you have a, a large fan base already, uh, it's your starting point to uh, to get the word out. I think that's that's uh, the main main stuff and and stay close to your uh, museum and content and 
it, then it should be fine, I guess. Did you hear that or? Yeah, yes, we did. We did. It's working now. We can't see you, but we can hear you. So that's good. That's it, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.